deserve all the things that you've done. You keep blessing me over and over again. Whoa, whoa, whoa. I once were lost deep in sin till I heard your voice singing, You're my child. But I'm not what I used to be Since it's cleansed and made Made me whole I gotta press toward the mark For the prize of the high calling Which is in Christ Jesus I cannot be left I won't be left behind
Let us pray. In the name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we come thanking you for your mercy and your grace, your faithfulness to each of us, your goodness and your loving kindness. Lord, we recognize that without you, we can do nothing. And so we ask in these moments you would be pleased to send a preacher. Prepare our hearts, Lord, and help us so that as we see and hear what you are saying through the scriptures by your spirit, that our hearts would be receptive and that our wills would yield and we would say, yes, Lord. We'll be careful, Lord, to give you all the praise, to give you all the glory. We ask only that you will speak words to us now that will help us to be like Jesus. For it is in his name we pray. Amen. First, in reverence to the spirit of Christ in whom we move and have our being, then with great appreciation and respect for our pastor, Reverend Fernando Downs, my co-laborer, Pastor Jerry Martin, for all those who serve as deacons in our church, the trustees, the various leaders of the ministries and auxiliaries of our congregation, the rank and file family of the Southside Church, and to all who are friends and guests chiming in and checking in via the internet during this season. We say to you on this the fifth Sunday of January in 2021, grace and peace from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If you'll indulge me on the day that this is distributed to the internet, my parents will celebrate 59 years of walking together in holy matrimony. All right. From my heart through YouTube and the internet to Carver and Maddie Williams. On this day we say celebrations are, are in order, respect, and congratulations on making 59 years. Mm -hmm. my, my, my. It's a blessing mm -hmm. that I have you as a mother and a father and I have your example as a husband and a wife. Hope you enjoy your day and uh, certainly hope you know that I stand in awe of you on this day. Now if you brought your Bible, I'm going to invite you to look with me in the book of the Gospel of John, John's Gospel chapter 8 verses 1 through 11. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. There is a, uh, an announcement I do need to make as you are finding that passage uh, concerning next Sunday, which will be First Sunday. And on First Sunday, you are aware we celebrate the Lord's table want to make you aware of that and remind you to have your, your juice and your crackers ready as we look forward to remembering the Lord's body and remembering the Lord's blood, which was generously, freely given that we might have the right to be called the sons and daughters of God. I want to put that on your calendar and remind you of that as we anticipate Lord's delay one more Sunday, first Sunday, and if it happens, we will be celebrating the Lord's table. You have your Bible. I'm reading from the Gospel of John chapter eight. I'm going to begin at verse one. In the interest of clarity, I'm going to read from the New Living Translation words that are found there, you find it, it reads like this in the New Living Translation. Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning 
he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote in the dust with his finger. They kept demanding an answer, so he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no more. This is the word of the Lord. Let us hear and be saved. For just a few moments, I want to share from this passage of scripture from the subject, the case for critical grace. Mm. The case for critical grace. I covet your prayers. Mm -hmm. Al Pacino in the 1979 movie, And Justice for All, played the part of a young, passionate lawyer assigned the responsibility of defending uh, the Honorable Judge Henry T. Fleming. Uh, as it were, in the narrative of the movie, uh, this this judge had been accused of a heinous crime and he needed to have a defense attorney. For those who are familiar with the movie, I just want to make you aware of the introductory statements made by Al Pacino's character as he began the task of defending his client. Mm -hmm. He attempted to remind the jury that this courtroom exists for the purpose of ensuring that everybody gets a fair shot at justice. The prosecutor has the job, the prosecutor has the job of bringing every person to account against the rule of the law. And the defense attorney has the responsibility of making sure that his client receives equal protection under the law. That, that, was, that, was, that was what Al Pacino's lawyer character presented. But for those who are rem remember the scene, Al Pacino's character said there's a problem in this proceeding, and the problem is the prosecutor forgot his case. The prosecutor forgot his case, and, 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 and because he forgot his case, uh, his client, his client, his client 
is probably not going to receive a fair measure of the adjudicative representative power and purpose of his role and function in the court of law. Those who know the story, I won't spoil it for you, but I will let you know this. Uh, in, in that movie, on that day, in that courtroom, in spite of the fact that the prosecutor forgot his case, uh, justice was served because of a gracious act of the defense attorney. And that's why I came to talk about the case for critical grace today. Uh, because, 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 uh, concerning, concerning God's purpose for me and concerning God's purpose for you, if the truth is told, mm -hmm. according to the scriptures, all, A-L-L, -L, all have sinned mm -hmm. and have come short of the glory of God. Uh, and, and if God wants to, if God wanted to, if God wanted to, God could hold every human being responsible for God's law and on the basis of that, uh, convict every human being guilty, uh, guilty, mm -hmm. guilty of all sin uh, and worthy of all punishment. Mm. The case for critical grace it's rooted in the reality that me and you, reverends and non-reverends, laity and clergy, and clergy, all stand under the same condemnation with respect to our guiltiness, our sinfulness. Mm -hmm. And all of us, therefore, need mercy and all of us need grace. I want to explore, and I'm just going to tell you up front, I'm not going to preach this whole message today. Uh, I've learned my lesson. I'm going to go as far as I can, and then I'm going to park it so that I can stay within appropriate uh, parameters. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. But I do want to frame this passage in light of four L's. I'm going to give you them now and then make my way down through them as much as I can before I park it and continue in another setting at another time. The case for critical grace as framed in this story, I have outlined in light of four L's. L number one is the legitimacy of the passage. Uh, L number two is the location of the process, the adjudication. L number three is the law of Moses. And then finally, L number four is the litigation itself. Uh, uh, those four L's frame how I want to come at this, the, the, the case for critical grace. If you don't mind, I want to start with the legitimacy of the passage. If you are reading any translation other than the King James translation, then in your Bible somewhere, either in the actual text or in the margins or the, uh, the, the annotations uh, underneath uh, at the bottom of the page, you, you find an asterisk or brackets or something around all of the verses I just read. And that is because uh, for a variety of reasons uh, related to New Testament scholarship, uh, these verses have been scrutinized, mm -hmm. scrutinized, uh, and uh, for a variety of scholarship reasons, uh, uh, many concluded at a certain point in New Testament scholarship that these verses uh, are questionable. And I've come in the interest of the case for critical grace to commend uh, for your thinking, to commend for your consideration, uh, the legitimacy of this passage and this story. Uh, uh, the, 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 the point, to, to hunk it off, because Reverend Williams don't want to get too deep in this, mm -hmm. is that the story that we are reading today is indeed a true and uh, accurate account of an interaction between Jesus 
and the religious teachers of the law and the Pharisees. That's the point. Uh, the point is we can trust the record of the Gospel of John, verses eight, uh, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, to be a legitimate and accurate reference to what actually happened when Jesus was teaching in the temple and what was actually said when Jesus interacted uh, with the crowd and was interrupted in the midst of his uh, teachings about grace by those who were the teachers of the law. We, we can rest on that, and I want you to know why we can. Uh, the, 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 the largesse of scholarship around this passage uh, was challenged principally by uh, two gentlemen, Westcott and Hort, who argued that we ought to have most of our confidence about these verses uh, chin-checked by the fact that they do not show up in uh, two very old manuscripts. For the sake of those who are Bible scholars, you know that one of those is the Codex Sinaiticus, and the other is the Codex Vaticanus. Well, someone said, well, Reverend, you're way over my head. Now, you, 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 you pass where I need to understand some things. And, and that's good because this is really, uh, uh, if you will, uh, minutia in the text, but it establishes the text. Uh, establishing the text, why is that important? Well, it's important uh, for reasons that help us to have confidence that the word of God has been preserved and is accurate and is infallible and is therefore authoritative. The, the authority of what we're going to look at today need not be scrutinized or diminished. It need not be uh, discounted and relegated. These words are indeed the words of Jesus and what Jesus says there and how the folk responded to Jesus there are indeed accurate representations of what actually happened. Well, Reverend, how 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 can how can you how can you how can you push back Westcott and Hort? They have doctor's degrees. Well, I didn't. I don't have one, but 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 Zane Hodges did, and I, I brought Zane with me today. Uh, Zane Hodges taught at Dallas Theological Seminary uh, for several years. Zane Hodges uh, and uh, Arthur Farsted in uh, their book, a seminal work entitled "The Greek New Testament According to the Majority Text." argue significantly uh, concerning the legitimacy, one, of the majority text, and two, on the basis of it, the passage that we're looking at here. The Gospel of John, chapter 8, verses 1 through 11, contains material which strikes at the heart of the case for critical grace because there in the temple, Jesus Christ teaching uh, is uh, interrupted by the teachers of the law and there in the temple Jesus Christ is uh, invited to become a part of a lynch mob by a group of religious people and his response there is an important response for us to study and to learn from it is quoted by Eusebius it is quoted by Papias. It is quoted by Irenaeus. Yeah. It is referenced by Polycarp, which means that all of what we are talking about here in these verses goes back to at least 125 AD, way before the Codex Sinaiticus and the Codex Vaticanus were ever even put in print. Uh, my point, my point, brothers and sisters, is what we're looking at here is reliable and authoritative. There's too much credit that's been given, too much credit that has been given uh, to the scholarship of men who, whose thinking was presumptuous. I'm going to go there and then I'm going to go to my message because it's important for us to appreciate uh, how people start playing with the word of God. Uh, Westcott and Hort, in their scholarship, argued uh, that the two translations I've referenced, the Vaticanus and the Sinaiticus, were neutral versions of the scriptures, uh, uh, that they were not in any way impacted by uh, the cultural and political dynamics of their time. But what we now know is that that is 
anything but the truth. Uh, the Vatican is references and reflects a variety of agendas because it was written and captured post nicene Creed. Uh, too, many, too many pastors were slaughtered uh, in the aftermath of the Nicene, uh, Nicene Convention. Can you imagine going to a, a conference meeting and because you disagree, you don't get to go home? Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I digress, but let me get to my point. My point is, brothers and sisters, what we are about to look at today as we explore the case for critical grace, uh, uh, what we are about to explore today is referenced and rooted in the relationships of pastors and bishops who walk out of the continuum of those who walk with Jesus or were mentored by those who walk with Jesus into the time of so-called trusted passages of Scripture. The legitimacy of the passage, uh, we can trust what we're reading in spite of what you might see in your Bible. Uh, we can trust that these are the actual words of Jesus Christ, and we need to be made certain. We need to be clear that this is so. I'll come back and maybe say something else about that, but what I want to hurry to is my second L, and that is the location. Look there in chapter 8, verse number 1. The text says uh, that uh, in the aftermath of a discourse uh, with the officers and chief priests, uh, in verse 45 of chapter 7, you go back and you said, then came the officers uh, to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said uh, unto them, why have ye not brought him? I need you to see that. Uh, it, 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 is, it is, this is the context in which Jesus' uh, dialogue and interruption with the teachers of the law and the Pharisees occurs. There has been a plot, a hatching. There has been an agenda of growing to capture Jesus. There has been a desire to, to, to have means by which to criminalize and discredit the Christ uh, on the behalf of folk who don't even like each other but are in concert in their disgust and disdain for Jesus. Uh, verses 45 down through 52 uh, rehearses the fact that in a variety of ways uh, several persons were looking for ways to trap Jesus. They were looking for ways to trap him according to the law of Moses. And I want to say this, uh, the, the case for critical grace is rooted in that very challenge, that very challenge, brothers and sisters, uh, that people uh, would like to, in too many cases, misuse the law to do anything but be justice and righteous. Misuse the law for the purpose of incriminating those who are innocent. And that is what is happening here in this passage, the case for critical grace, the location. Where does this happen? This happens in the temple after Jesus comes back from praying in the garden. Verse number one of Acts of John chapter eight, Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. He went unto the Mount of Olives uh, because he had just gone through a, another round if you don't mind, another round of being scrutinized, of being antagonized, of being hostily engaged, uh, of, of being challenged, uh, and, uh, and being accused. So after prayer, verse number two, early in the morning, he came back again. I like that about Jesus. Jesus, in spite of the fact that he knew going uh, forward in grace, he would be challenged again. Jesus keeps coming back to the location. What is that location? There it is, verse number two. And early in the morning, he came again into the temple. There it is, the location. The location. Jesus comes into the house of God, and there in the house of God, Jesus begins to teach grace. Jesus began uh, to teach by parable and by various uh, methods, methods of analogy. He begins to help the people to understand the grace of God and to understand the love of God. 
there, there in, there in the temple. And it is important that we appreciate where Jesus would position himself in the temple. We know from reading uh, elsewhere in the Gospel of John and in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus was particular about positioning himself in the court near the treasury. That would put him uh, somewhere outside of where the men only could go, uh, but in a space where the women could hear him teach and the Gentiles. Uh, the treasury, unfortunately, by the time of Jesus, uh, uh, was, was located in what was supposed to be the largest space, near the largest space in the temple, uh, preserved specifically for the Gentiles. Uh, and Jesus would, when he would come to teach, Jesus would come into the temple and Jesus would position himself uh, where the women could hear him and where any Gentiles could hear him. Oh, my brothers and sisters, this is, this is missiologically significant for the case concerning critical grace. Uh, uh, most of, most of the teachers of the law would position themselves in the men only section of the temple uh, in intimating by so doing that what they had to say concerning the law of God, what they had to say concerning the love of God was for men only, but not Jesus. Uh, in in Jesus's case uh, for critical grace, by very posture and position, Jesus demonstrates that what he has to say uh, in behalf of God is available uh, not just for men only, but for women uh, as well. And, and not just for Hebrew women only, but for anybody who finds value in the temple of God. Jesus, according to the scriptures, positions Jesus himself in the temple and he did it again and again look there uh, and, and all the people came to him and then I want you to note two things about his posture uh, he positions himself in the temple near the treasury which would mean women had access to listen and learn uh, Gentiles had access to listen and learn and of course uh, men uh, could come as well uh, and listen and learn uh, about the love of God <clears throat> but, but, but note the posture uh, of Jesus verse number two I'm still there the passage says that uh, Jesus, when he came into the temple near the treasury area with access and availability, accessibility and availability for all, uh, note the two things there concerning his posture. Number one, he sat. And number two, uh, he taught them. There, there in the passage, verse number two, he sat down. And number two, uh, he he taught them. Well, uh, brothers and sisters, the, the case for grace, for critical grace, we, we find there that God's desire, uh, modeled by Jesus Christ, is that there is access uh, to hear and learn from a loving Savior who will sit down and will make it plain to all of the people not just the men people, but the women people, not just the women people, but people uh, from every stripe and nation who find value in the temple. Now, finding value in the temple was the initial intention for God making a Hebrew nation in the first place. Uh, God intended that among all of the other nations on the planet, that his people would be a royal priesthood. His people would be a holy nation. His people would be a peculiar people, a people of distinction because they were set apart. Uh, there would be some things that people who came among his people could experience uniquely and only in the company of his people because his people were connected with God. God's intention was that anywhere else on the planet you might look, the one place you can find mercy 
is among the people of God. Anywhere else on the planet you might look, the one place you can always find love and hope is among the, the people of God. And, and, and anywhere else in the world you might look, the one place you can for sure enough find justice is among the people of God. Jesus comes to that institution, which is, if you will, the most sacred space among the people. And there in that location, Jesus attempts to teach grace. Jesus attempts to model grace. Jesus attempts to demonstrate what the incarnation is all about. That is God with us, Emmanuel. That is the Prince of Peace and the Everlasting Father making plain who God is, what God is like, and what God's design is for the human experience. There, Jesus is proclaiming, Jesus is, is declaring the gospel, uh, good news that all might partake in it, that all might have their uh, hearts healed in it, that all might have their hopes lifted by it, and that all might be partakers in the joy of it. And then something happens. It's interrupted. Look there at verse number three. Verse number three says, And the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they spoke to her. That brings me to my next L. My next L is the litigation. Look there, if you will. The verse makes it plain that while Jesus is focusing on learning, uh, the scribes and the Pharisees come with a lynch mob. They come with a litigious agenda, but the whole goal is to lynch uh, somebody. That, that's right, I said it, I did, I used that word. I said uh, a lynch mob. Uh, right here in this passage, we have religious teachers and we have, uh, we have Pharisees. So, so we have two classes concerning the law uh, among people. One are the professional professors of the law and the other is those who uh, by pretense uh, proclaim to be perfect practisers of the law. Uh, the, 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 the scribes uh, had their PhDs in the Torah. They, they, they were meticulous in uh, exploring the minutia of the Torah. They, they were uh, exact in their estimation uh, of what it was that Moses meant uh, in the first five books. Uh, Talmud and several other of the uh, collected writings uh, reflect their attempt to get at, to parse, and to pull uh, into the most intimate details all of what the law of Moses intends uh, concerning uh, the heart and mind of God, the, the scribes, the religious teachers, they were the professional professors of the law. Uh, and so, so they're, they're coming and, and, and their interest in this is peculiar. Uh, but that's not all that, that's referenced here. The other group that's referenced here concerning God's law are those who were considered among the variety of flavors of Hebrew traditions of faith to be uh, the self-identified uh, proclaimers of perfected practice concerning the law of God. Now, you had the Sadducees, you had the Essenes, you had the Zealots, uh, but then you had the Pharisees who considered themselves to be the Orthodox, if you will, uh, the, the folks who, who do not stray to the left as liberals, uh, who do not stray to the right as fundamental radicals, but they are right there, uh, right there in the middle, holding down what it means to be true to the law of Moses. Uh, both camps are in alliance here with an agenda to litigate against grace according to the law of Moses. It's interesting that the, that the framing of this text suggests verse three that the scribes and the Pharisees actually brought somebody as bait with an agenda to catch Jesus. The, the, the goal here is not to, to be a pursuer of justice, 
The goal here is not justice. The goal here is Jesus. And the case for critical grace, brothers and sisters, is rooted in this. Uh, whenever the goal is not justice, whenever the goal is not righteousness, the only solution can be found in grace. Here, Jesus is in the location. Jesus is proclaiming. Jesus is teaching. But his teaching concerning grace is interrupted by a lynch mob intent on litigating. There it is. The verse says, verse 4, They say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery. I'm reading now in the King James, in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might have to accuse him. Uh, let me get into the litigation. Uh, this is kind of juicy, brothers and sisters, uh, but, but, but walk with me if you will. Here in the litigation uh, is an interesting, frastic uh, spin. For those who are students of the Sermon on the Mount, you are aware that there in Matthew chapters 5 through 7, Jesus, as he seeks to speak to the crowds who would come, makes an interesting framing of his message. He says there, you have heard it said, but I say. Uh, but, but here in this litigation uh, of a lynch mob, we have an interesting spin on that very dialogue. Uh, the, the, the religious teachers and the Pharisees come and they say to Jesus, uh, we have heard Moses say, <laughs> uh, but what do you say? Uh, it is intended, it is intended by way of litigation to plainly uh, lay bare their principal goal, which is not this person, but Jesus himself. The case for critical grace, brothers and sisters, is at the crux of that very dilemma. Here, here it is. They are, they are really after Jesus. They are hoping to find a way to get Jesus. They are hoping that they will, on the basis of what they are able to trap him into saying, cause him to be discredited and discounted concerning his value and view of the law of Moses. Now, that, that brings me to, to my other L I'm going to explore. Uh, and that is the law of Moses. Now, the, the, the law of Moses is at bar here. What, what, what would Moses say? What would, what would Moses do? Uh, Moses and what Moses had to say in what we call uh, the Pentateuch, the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament, according to the Old Testament canon. Uh, what, what is it that Moses would say and how is it that Moses uh, would adjudicate? Uh, the law of Moses. And, and I need to say this at this particular point. Uh, the law of Moses is not the issue. The law is good. Uh, Psalm number 19, if you have your Bible, walk with me there. Concerning the law, this is what the psalmist David said. David, uh, the, the sweet singer of Israel, David, the one who was called a friend of God, said this in Psalm 19 about the law of the Lord. Uh, verse 7, Psalm 19, the law of the Lord is perfect. And that's not the issue, brothers. The issue, uh, uh, sisters, is not the law. The, the issue is lawyers. Uh, the, the issue is not whether or not God's judgments are good. The, the question is, are, are the judges of men uh, up to the task of the justice of God? Uh, the, the issue is not whether or not God's commandments and instructions are are faulty, that the question is, will men and women stand up and stand under the rule of God's law? Law, the psalmist says, is perfect. Uh, the statutes of the Lord are right. Uh, the fear of the Lord is clean. Uh, listen, uh, the, 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 the words of God uh, and God's instruction 
God's statutes, God's legislation. Those are not the problems. The problem for me and for you comes when we as human beings start uh, wrestling with uh, whether we will stand under the law of God or be bought off and compromise. There, there in, there in this, there in this discussion, this litigation. Uh, the scribes and the Pharisees challenge Jesus. What do you say? Now, what I think is interesting in this passage is that uh, a sitting Jesus stoops down. I hope you don't miss that. Uh, Jesus was already sitting, but in response to, in, uh, if you will, uh, response and or reaction to uh, this egregious agenda, Jesus stoops down and begins to write in the sand. Scholars for years have wrestled with what Jesus could possibly have been writing in the sand. Uh, I, I have no, I have no idea. I have no idea what Jesus could have been writing in the sand, but I do want to invite you to appreciate what they had brought to Jesus concerning the law of Moses. It, maybe, 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 maybe Jesus was processing uh, what Moses actually said. If you have your Bible, look with me. Deuteronomy chapter 22. If you have your Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 22, they are referencing the statement of Moses found there, verses 22 through 25. I'm going to read those for you in your hearing. Deuteronomy chapter 22 uh, verse 22 beginning, this is what it says. If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die. Both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, uh, so shalt thou put evil uh, away, put away evil from Israel. Verse 23, if a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto an husband, uh, and a man find her in the city and lie with her. Then ye shall bring them both out unto the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. Uh, the damsel, because she cried not being in the city, and the man, because he hath humbled his neighbor's wife. So shalt thou put away evil from among you. Uh, so shalt thou put away evil from among you. But if a man uh, find a betrothed damsel in the field and the man force her and lie with her, then the man only that lay with her shall die. But unto the damsel thou shalt do nothing. There is in the damsel no sin worthy of death. For as when a man riseth against his neighbor and slayeth him, even so is this matter. My Lord. My Lord, we have a dilemma, brothers and sisters. According to the law of God, which is perfect, according to the statutes of God, which are right, according to the fear of the Lord, which is clean, uh, we have a dilemma. And, and I believe, I believe, I believe that Jesus stooped down uh, because we have a dilemma, brothers and sisters. And, and it is at the heart of, it is at the crux of what makes for the case for critical grace. Uh, 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 just like Al Pacino, uh, the, the prosecution has forgot to bring the most compelling evidences of their case. We're missing a man. Did you see that? Deuteronomy chapter 22 verses 22 through 25 makes it plain that in the adjudicative proceedings, uh, as it relates to the law of Moses, you need a man. Don't miss this, please. There, 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 there is, there is, there is nowhere in those verses any indication or instruction that you can punish a woman unless you have somebody who is a man on the stand in the process. And my brothers and sisters, the case for critical grace stands on that very challenge. The misuse of the law to criminalize and brutalize the least of these strikes at the heart 
of what grieves the heart of God. Here, here, here in these verses, religious men who claim to be professional professors of the law and Pharisees, persons whose, whose pretense is that they are the perfect practisers of the law, no better than to just bring a woman to be stoned and ask Jesus, what do you say? Walk with me into the litigation. Uh, while I was an undergraduate student, I had the privilege of learning lessons in the law from Dr. Sharon Banks, who at Howard University, which is still the mecca of higher education in the free world, was herself a colleague of Thurgood Marshall under the tutelage of Charles Hamilton Houston. Uh, uh, Dr. Banks uh, made a, a couple challenging points uh, because she never ever gave us a written exam. You had to come to class and take your test uh, verbally, oral exams. Uh, I'll never forget those exams. Uh, thank God for Jesus and grace, uh, but I digress. Uh, uh, the, the, the first principles that I learned as we uh, learned law uh, from Dr. Banks was the whole question of due process. Uh, due process. Uh, due process in, in legal proceedings uh, is supposed to ensure that everything is done according to the, the principles and the steps as outlined in the specific document that you hold to be authoritative and binding. Due process. And, and, and right here, right here in these verses, the case for critical grace is is built upon the fact that there are significant, egregious violations of Mosaic due process. Look here in the verse. Uh, I read the verse in John chapter 8. They brought a woman. And they brought a woman and they placed her in the middle of the crowd. But they were missing the most compelling piece of evidence uh, to say that they had a woman that they caught in the act and not have the other actor is a violation of Mosaic due process. Deuteronomy 22, I'm going to read it. I'm going to read it again. Read it, read it again. Read it again, Reverend. Let me, let me read it again. Deuteronomy chapter 22, I'm skipping down because I don't want to waste all my time. But look there, the verse says, If a damsel that is a virgin be betrothed unto a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out. Did you see both? It's right there. Let me go ahead and get my New Living Translation. I just want to make sure I'm not misleading somebody. Deuteronomy chapter 22. Uh, I'm reading from the New Living Translation, and, and I'm, I'm going to start it at verse 23. Deuteronomy chapter 22 at verse number 23. In the interest of time, it says, Suppose a man meets a young woman, a virgin who is engaged to be married, and he has sexual intercourse with her. If this happens within a town, you must take both of them to the gates of that town and stoned them to death. Now, they, they were bringing this person to Jesus to be stoned, which suggests that she was at least either verse 23 uh, category or the subsequent verse 25. He, in, in either case, you need a man. Both is in the text. And, and I wonder, I wonder, I wonder if uh, Jesus was writing due process questions in the dirt. I wonder if Jesus was writing the word both in, in the dirt. I, I wonder if Jesus was, 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 was working his way through the text of Moses uh, in these verses alone. I could go to Leviticus, but I'm out of time and I don't want to get there. Uh, but if I did get there, it's even more, it's even more uh, definitive. Here's the point. The case for critical grace, brothers and sisters, orbits around the challenges that humans in our frailty, humans in our uh, foolishness, humans in our faultiness are vulnerable to mm -hmm. concerning mixed agendas. They needed both to stone them. And without both, there's a problem. What is the dilemma? Here's the dilemma. 
Come back with me to Deuteronomy chapter 22. The verse says, get them both and stone them both. Why? So that you can purge Israel of such evil. What are you saying, Reverend? If indeed, if, ind if indeed, if indeed, brothers and sisters, the goal is to live according to the law, if indeed the goal is to live out uh, uh, according to professional, prof professorial uh, estimations, the law, if the goal is to live out a perfected, unbiased uh, practice of the law, then every man and every woman who is guilty of what the law says ought to pay the price. But if there is any deference, if there is any bias, if there is any bigotry, if folk can be bought off, uh, if, 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 excuse me, if, if elected people uh, won't do their job, then they make the case for critical grace themselves. If, 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 if somebody can, can be found guilty of inciting uh, riots and actually insinuate murder, can be exempt, then you've just made the case for critical grace by your impotence to practice the law without bias. There in this passage, Jesus has stooped down. Jesus is writing in the sand. Maybe he wrote both. Maybe, maybe he said, where's the man? Or maybe he just groaned over the fact that to just bring one woman here does not take evil out of Israel. And Israel, because it still has evil on the basis of your weak approaches to the law, needs grace more than it needs the law. Here, here, here Moses, here Moses' mind, uh, here the imagination of God, uh, the agenda, the motive is there, it's there. That evil might be put away, get everybody who's guilty. But if you are going to be partial in how you deal with guilt, then you have just made the case for critical grace. Let me. Let me try and hunk it off. I kept you way too long. Uh, I'll have to come back and get my other couple points. Maybe some other time. But I do want you to see something. I told you Jesus stooped down. And I can't leave you, I can't leave you with Jesus stooped down. I can't do that. If you give me just a couple more seconds, I want to get him up. Uh, Jesus stood up. That's in the text. John chapter 8. The verse says that having stooped down, uh, they kept pressing him. Uh, what you going to say? What, how, 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 how are you going to answer? What, what, is, what is your opinion? What, what is us going to do? What, 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 what do you say we should do, Jesus? And they pressed him and, and Jesus stood up. And he made a statement. All right. You who have never sinned. We'll let you cast the first stone. Brothers and sisters, the wisdom of Jesus concerning the law is this. Let, let, the, let the person who has never sinned be the person who throws the first song. There, 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 is, there is wisdom there. Uh, scholars have wrestled with uh, what, what did Jesus mean by without sin, never sin. Uh, some scholars are, are of the opinion that Jesus uh, is trying to eliminate the whole crowd in the lynch mob. He says, if, if you have never sinned at all, uh, then, 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 then you cast the first song. That, that would have eliminated everybody. There's nobody who has the authority because there's nobody uh, other than Jesus who has never sinned. 
Maybe, maybe that is, maybe that is the agenda. Maybe that is the objective of Jesus, having been pressed hard by people who are clearly misusing the law of Moses, having been pressed hard by people who are clearly bought off in their agenda, uh, broken people attempting to break Jesus. Maybe Jesus wanted to give them a gentle pushback uh, and say, you're not even righteous enough to practice the law of Moses. Uh, maybe that was the goal. Uh, if you have never sinned, you can cast the first stone. Maybe that, that, that is the, 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 the interpretation. Some scholars are of that opinion that he was trying to, to rule out the whole crowd. Other scholars are of this opinion that Jesus was trying to find out who who in good conscience was, was not guilty of this sin? Some scholars are of the opinion Jesus was, was saying, if you've never sinned at all. But other scholars are of the opinion that is a contextual est estimation and application. If you've never done this sin, that is, see, if you, if you as a man have not done what you are, are, are uh, accusing this woman of, if you've never been on the other side of the act that this woman has been caught in, then you cast the first stone. E either way, either way you, you, you chalk it up, you look at the results, and you find that everybody left. Well, let me hurry to my parking point, because I'm not finished preaching. Uh, my parking point is this, the litigation. The litigation ended... Uh, with no prosecution. The, the, the litigation ended without a prosecutor. I, I hope you don't miss this. Uh, Jesus was teaching in the temple and he was interrupted by a lynch mob intending to litigate and catch him on the way to stoning someone. And with one statement after stooping down, uh, standing up, Jesus' one statement Anyone here who has never sinned can lead us to cast the first stone caused uh, there to be a due process dilemma because now there was no longer a prosecution. And you can't have a case if you don't have a prosecuting attorney <laughs> who will stand at the law to defend and implement the law. If you don't have a prosecution, you don't have a case. You don't have a case for a prosecution. You have made another layer of the case for critical grace. The judge has to say, if there is no prosecution, there is no case. And if there is no case for enforcing an execution, all that we're left with is grace. Well, a few years ago, the O'Neill twins referenced a song testifying they said I was guilty of all the charges uh, and, and, and doomed uh, to disgrace. Uh, but Jesus, with his special love, uh, he reached down uh, and he saved me uh, in, in, in my space. Uh, he, here's the chorus. Jesus dropped the charges. And now I'm free. Brothers and sisters, the case for critical grace made here on the legitimacy of this passage because of this location in the temple, uh, in light of the law of Moses and this peculiar litigation is on this order. Jesus says, I don't condemn you either. Go, you're free. Go, you have a future. And sin no more. This is the gospel, brothers and sisters, that those who are guilty, those who are actually completely worthy of the punishment and the penalty for rebellion and disobedience, who can find Jesus Christ as their attorney, will find in Christ one who will defend, one who will redeem, and one who will advocate. The good news of the gospel 
is that for those who are guilty, where the law of Moses cannot help you, the love of God demonstrated in Christ on the cross always will. Let's be clear that that day, this sister got off on a technicality. Uh, she got off because there was no prosecution. But you and I cannot make that disclaimer. Uh, technicality or not, the scripture says that all have sinned. Yeah. And everybody needs someone who's not only a good attorney, you and I need a savior who is willing not just to advocate in our behalf, but to propitiate in our behalf, to die, to pay the price that you and I might experience forgiveness and pardon. The case of critical grace during this season is appropriate if you are here listening by YouTube and you know that you stand in need of a savior, we invite you to try Christ. He has never lost a case. He has always pardoned. And he stands ready to do the same again for me and for you. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this litigation. Lord, we thank you for the law of Moses. But Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus, his willingness to come again and again, to advocate in our behalf, and ultimately to suffer and die in our place. Help us, Lord, to come and respond to that grace to come and allow Christ to be our source of forgiveness and strength, to be our savior and redeemer, the one who cancels our past, embraces us in the present, and affords us a future in spite of who we have been. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen.
your name Cause I need you right now, Lord mm, I'm calling your name Cause I need you, Lord right now, Lord Well, sometimes I get tired And sometimes I get weak That's why I'm calling Call your, your name Cause I need you right now, Lord Yeah, I'm calling your name Cause I need you right now, Lord Yeah, I'm calling your name, Lord Cause I need you, Lord right now, Lord Well, sometimes I get tired And sometimes I get weak That's why I'm calling Call your, your name Yeah, cause I need you right now, Lord mm, I'm praying this prayer right now, cause I need you, Lord. Right now, Lord. Yeah, I'm praying this prayer right now, cause I need you, Lord. Right now, Lord. Mm. Well, sometimes I wake it hard, and sometimes I wake it up. That's why I'm calling Call you. Your name. Yeah, cause I need you. Right now, Lord. Sing uh, this song right now, cause I need you. I'm sick in my body, Lord. Right 